Catherine Miles visits her parents in the Amazon for her summer vacation. As they go on a picnic using her father's new boat, they soon face horrors they'd never imagined encountering. Catherine is prosecuted for her uncle and aunt's deaths and pleads not guilty. The judge asks her how she got to the Amazon, since she was a student. She explains that her parents had a 6,000 hectare rubber plantation in Rio Fuentes, and it was normal for her to visit her parents every summer. She also saw the area as a paradise. When the judge inquires about her awareness of the headhunter tribes, she admits to it but emphasizes that they were unreal dangers to her then. When she celebrated her birthday, she returned to Rio Fuentes with her parents, aunt and uncle. Her parents gave their daughter a golden crucifix with rubies. Her aunt, Maria de Vega, apologized to Catherine for not having any presents since they were poor, which solicited a meaningful look from Mr. Miles. Maria's husband, Jose de Vega, greeted Catherine sweetly and kissed her hand. Afterward, her relatives suggested a picnic the following day using her father's new houseboat, and so they did. However, as they went to the dock, Jose told Mrs. Miles that it was better for them to ride another boat since he had to attend to some business, and the lady gave them the speedboat. A helicopter arrived and Mr. Miles explained that it was the postal service that also helped them patrol the area. The pilot enthusiastically greeted him and congratulated Catherine on her birthday before leaving. As the trip began, everything seemed perfect and Catherine thanked her parents for the beautiful gift. Her father then shared an important lesson, telling her to enjoy her life to the fullest and never give up, regardless of the circumstances. Mrs. Miles noticed Maria and Jose catching up in the speedboat with workers. She commented that they had always brought servants around since they started working for them. She expressed her disappointment for bringing servants on a family picnic and asked her husband to remind them, but the man ignored the behavior. The wife pointed out that Jose had always been bad at what he did, but the husband argued that it was precisely why he worked for them now and was improving at running the plantation. Therefore, Mrs. Miles joked that they could retire and return to London if that was the case, but her sister wouldn't like to take over. Mr. Miles argued that the couple was working hard because they liked the plantation and anybody would think it was a tempting offer. He decided to talk to them later, but Catherine interjected that the Amazon was fantastic and she'd prefer to stay rather than go to England with her aunt and uncle. Her mother promised to return with her instead, and in her happiness, Catherine yelled the news to her relatives. At present, the prosecutor asks Catherine if they did anything that would anger the natives, but she claims they didn't. She narrates that when her father stopped the boat at a good place for the picnic, they were suddenly hit by blowguns, ending her parents' lives immediately while she was shot in the arm. The judge questions why she didn't escape, and she justifies that it has curare, a native poison that paralyzes the victim before it takes full effect. Therefore, she could only hear what was happening before she fainted. She regained consciousness when a group of headhunters from the Guainira tribe arrived at the boat. A man named Umakai removed the poison from her arm, but still, her mobility was limited. Another man took her father's hunting knife and her parents' heads as a trophy. She was tied up in a bamboo pole and they carried her back to their village as a servant. During the trip, the same man who took her father's blade also took her necklace, so Umukai scolded him and sent him away. Afterward, they were attacked by the Tamuli, an enemy tribe of man-eaters, but Umukai defeated their leader and took his head as a trophy. A week after their disappearance, the postal service roamed the area to look for the plantation owners. They spotted the boat and the lifeless bodies of the couple, so they immediately notified the police. Soon, they arrived and retrieved the bodies. On the other hand, the poison's effect was already gone. Catherine walked with the Guainiras until they finally arrived in the village, where she saw a circular hut called the Shapon where everyone lived. Many natives approached her to touch her since they were intrigued, but Umukai sent them away and presented her to Chief Ramwani. The chief touched her and found her smell unpleasant, so he commanded the women to clean her up. Then, he saw Mr. Miles' blade and took it from Umukai, but the warrior kept it to himself. Even if he was a poor tribe member, he was the strongest warrior, so the chief respected his strength. After washing her up and greasing her with the oil they use, Catherine was brought to the center of the Shapon to present her to everyone. Ashamed of being in front of everyone, she crouched to protect herself, but a tribesman commanded her to stand straight, and Umukai ushered him away. Fameteri, the wealthiest man in the tribe, offered a water dog, a goose, and a turtle to the chief to claim her. Upon seeing this, Umukai offered his spear, the knife, the necklace, and himself to Fameteri to claim her since he had nothing else to offer, but the rich man declined. Catherine was immediately brought to the rich man's quarters. He commanded his other wives to hold her down as he took her, but he stopped upon discovering that she was still pure, since the women in their tribe got their purity taken early. Abruptly, the prosecutor stops her from talking since he finds this irrelevant, but her lawyer insists that it's essential to establish their defense. 
so the judge allows her to continue. She recalls wanting to end her life but remembered her father's words to continue living no matter what. She narrates that the Guaineras treated her like a child and left her alone sometimes. Though she tried to escape, there was nowhere to go and she was always greeted with the reality of how weak she was compared to the wild animals that could attack her. Aside from that, the warriors always pursued her like a game they'd created. Once she returned to the village, the women conducted a ritual to take her purity. The tribe celebrated afterwards since it was a religious ritual for them. She was taken to Famentary's hut and tried to escape, but she was caught and battered. A disabled tribesman, Garagueli, tried to help her, but he was pushed aside. Fortunately, Umukai challenged Famateri to a duel to claim ownership of Catherine, and the young warrior won by taking the other man's life. In Umukai's hut, Luamari, his sister, surprisingly spoke to her with little English to explain that she was now her brother's woman. The prosecutor doubts her testimony, so Catherine explains that Luamari was brought up on an American mission until she was seven. Therefore, she can remember how to use the language even a little. That evening, Famateri was cremated as the villagers chanted. Though she always wanted to escape, there was no opportunity. The prosecutor asks her if she served Umukai as a woman, but her lawyer and the judge allow her to refuse to answer. However, she states that the man respected her and patiently taught her their ways. However, every time she saw her father's blade and her necklace, she was reminded of her parents' fate, so she remained hostile toward him. Weeks passed and she found refuge in her makeshift flute while gaining rights as a regular villager and Umukai's woman, so she tried her best to get accustomed to their culture. Still, whenever she passed the hut where they kept their trophies and saw her parents' heads displayed, she felt hatred toward the tribe. Catherine continued learning about the tribe, especially during the women's period when they were separated from the rest and lived in trees. She adds that she was planning an escape but had to be cautious since she learned that if a woman betrayed her man in any way, the punishment was severe. One night, during her isolation, she escaped and took her parents' heads to bury them. Garagueli and Umukai witnessed her actions, but they kept it a secret even if the disabled man got battered for not guarding the trophies well. Feeling guilty, she used her knowledge to align Garagueli's bones as he recuperated. However, the peaceful times ended when Adari, a married woman, was caught in her affair with another man. As punishment, the man was tied upside down and his face was covered with honey to attract insects until his life ended. On the other hand, Adari was bathed before being offered to the river god. As she got on the boat, resigned to her fate, Catherine pleaded with the women to at least give her a paddle for a chance of survival, but they stood firm on their beliefs. All Catherine could do was call Adari as the boat got swallowed by the rampaging waters. This worsened Catherine's depression and hostility toward Umukai, since she witnessed how her life might end if she betrayed him. However, she also realized that Umukai might be her only key to escaping this place. After a while, Gargueli recovered and with Catherine's treatment, he managed to walk again. This action was acknowledged by the villagers and the chief, as they thought she had magic, so they celebrated the miraculous event. Then, Umukai began to act more sweetly toward her. She still rejected him, despite Lamari's explanation that her brother truly loved her. After a while, Catherine worked like all the other women. She weaved, gathered fruits, prepared food, and often went fishing using a poison that was harmless to humans. She narrates how savage the jungle could be, but also points out that nature was wonderful and good things happened just like when Lomari shared the news of her pregnancy. However, the prosecutor points out that despite her claims of innocence and hardships in the jungle, she's still guilty of ending two lives. The defense lawyer argues that these recollections are essential to establish that her experiences pushed her to do what she did. Catherine reminisces about how Umukai did his best to show his sincerity toward her by learning English from Lomari. Still, she expressed how she hated the man for taking her parents' lives, though Luomari clarified that it wasn't her brother who did it, but the other men from the city. In fact, Umukai was a witness during the attack. They were interrupted when a helicopter arrived, so Catherine ran to ask for help. However, one of the men shouts at the natives, taking away some of the villagers' lives. Though Catherine's group ran into the trees to hide, the bounty hunters threw explosives to chase them out. They had no choice but to step out, and unfortunately, the helicopter chased Luomari and a kid she was trying to save. The hunters shot at them, ending their lives. Then, they left the aircraft and took Luomari's head for the bounty. Meanwhile, Umukai and Catherine could only hide behind the bushes as they witnessed a horrible scene. This triggered her trauma, and she blamed Umukai for her parents' demise. Umukai explained that men from the city took her parents' lives. Catherine refused to listen, so the warrior slapped her to awaken her. Then, he narrates the events of that day. He saw that after the men used blowguns toward the people in the houseboat, they rode the speedboat with a couple. 
Then, the couple conspired to end Catherine's parents' lives as they threw their lifeless bodies into the river before leaving. Catherine believed Umukai's story but remained puzzled about the unknown couple's identity. Finally, her hostility toward Umukai melted and she told him that she had to go home, but the man told her that it was dangerous. Still, she decided to leave, but she got attacked by a snake. Fortunately, Umukai saved her but got bitten in her place, so a few moments later, he collapsed due to the poison. Catherine attended to him, and this became the beginning of their mutual love. One day, Umukai returned with a boat he won by challenging the Karawari tribe. Days after, the warrior threw his knife away to revoke his nature as a headhunter, making Catherine realize Umukai's complete dedication to her. Because of this, she gave herself entirely to him. Despite this, her desire to know who was responsible for her parents' demise remained, and she wanted revenge, so she convinced Umukai to escort her home and he finally agreed. This was the only way for her to recover from the horror she experienced. Once they arrived at the dock, Catherine saw that the signs had changed as the Devegas took over the plantation. Concluding that her uncle and aunt plotted the attack to obtain the plantation, she returned to the mansion with a bow and arrow, filled with rage. She also grabbed an axe that she found along the way. Soon, she discovered her aunt and uncle sleeping in her parents' bedroom. The Devegas were surprised upon seeing her. Maria denied her return since she believed she was gone. While the women converse, Jose sneakily opened the drawer for a weapon, but Catherine shot him with a poisoned bow, terrifying Maria. Catherine asked who planned the evil deeds, and her aunt blamed her husband. Still, the heiress refused to believe her as she knew they conspired to do this, proven by them basking in her deceased parents' wealth. Catherine wounded Maria with a poison arrow, paralyzing her. Then she decapitated them as revenge. When she returned to Umukai, she confessed what she'd done, even though she'd be condemned for her actions since it was taboo for the Guainira women to shed blood. Torn between his divine tribal law and his love for Catherine, he let the woman ride the boat and paddle away with her. However, upon seeing the man's despair, Catherine jumped off and swam back to the city to surrender to the police, leading to her current trial. Her defense lawyer asked the jury and the judge to consider her mitigating circumstances that pushed her to savagely end her relatives' lives, so he claims temporary insanity. However, the prosecutor argues that it's a deliberate act. Therefore, he presents the video of how the authorities found the deceased couple in their bed. Her lawyer used this film as proof that only a deranged person can do these acts, especially at Catherine's age and circumstances. Therefore, she's also a victim of everything that occurred. Soon, she's sentenced to eight years of confinement in a mental institution. The video presented to the court and a short clip of Catherine in the asylum from a local photographer are pieces of evidence of her experiences. Years later, Catherine is married to a British architect and never talks about her traumatic experiences aside from a reporter she allows to make a feature of her story. Some people claim she's sometimes detached as if her mind is elsewhere. Still, Catherine believes she's happy with her current life, especially with her child. However, fragments of her past with Umukai remain, especially when he decided to take his own life since his beliefs won't allow him to live with Catherine anymore. These are memories she'll keep throughout her lifetime. Subscribe to watch more videos like this. Turn on notifications and leave a like to help the channel out. Thank you for watching.